thank you all for coming here. Um, for some of you, this might be the first uh, bigger event in person. We've had a few events over the last weeks, actually, where I meet guests that say, I'm so happy to be out after 18 months of isolation and working through Zoom uh, and other digital equipment that we can finally meet in person again. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm very glad to welcome you here today at the Netherlands Embassy and to meet you uh, in person. Um, there is a saying in the Netherlands, uh, some of you understand Dutch, and if you know our language, there's always a strong <laughs> sound in it. Um, there's a saying um, uh, which uh, is, uh, wie de jeugd heeft, heeft de toekomst, and it actually means... Um, the future is in the hands of, uh, of the youth, of the younger generation. Um, and if you look at the Dutch criminal system, um, we take this uh, saying to heart and we focus very much in our system on prevention. Uh, of course, we are determined to fight crime, international crime, ransomware, cyber attacks, uh, but also the broader aspects of crime. Uh, but more importantly, we want to prevent we want crime uh, 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 we want to prevent crime from happening. Uh, so be in the first phase. Uh, and then the question always we ask ourselves is, um, how can we help young adults and sometimes even children to make the right choices so that they don't end up on the wrong side uh, and become career criminals? And how do you deal with that question? And it's not a question which is unique to the Netherlands. It's a question which is relevant uh, in the whole world. I mean, do we lock them up as long as possible in order to prevent society from you know, making uh, them mistakes again uh, and hurting society? Do we um, just slap them on the wrist and say, you know, this is just a warning, don't let it happen the next time? give them a second chance? Uh, or do we simply hope a kind of laissez-faire attitude and say, no, you know, we believe there will be some correction mechanism, you will change your life and hopefully you will become a more valuable citizen and contribute to society. Those are all options, uh, uh, as I said, where we are all struggling with. And we should ask the question, which approach is the best approach? Now, I'm very glad to have amongst our uh, audience today Dr. Uh, Bess Streisinger. She traveled the world broadly to see, to see um, how different countries and cultures deal with the similar uh, ch uh, challenges that I just described. Um, and I look very much forward to, uh, to watching your documentary. Then I'm very honored um, that Attorney General Carl Racine is here with us today and that you will share your perspective on dealing with youth, youth justice in the uh, District of Columbia here and tell us about the possible innovations that you, that you might see in order to improve the system. And we already discussed a little bit just before the meeting on that uh, because um, I spoke with, uh, with Clinton Lacey, who is here today, and also Antonio Fernandez, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing their experience with the concept uh, of the Credible Messenger program. Then I'd like to thank my uh, country fellow woman, uh, Jeske Wallis Lems, who is here from the Custodial Institutions Agency of the Dutch Ministry of Justice and Security. Again, if you talk about hard G's, you would call it in Dutch the Dienst Justitiële Inrichtingen, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for coming over and for attending our program today um, and maybe telling us more about the Dutch perspective on these events. Uh, because you're going to say something about the five experiences that we have, five experiments that we have uh, with an open justice uh, center. Uh, and I think that you will see then that the Netherlands uh, want to give our youth, and then I come back to the introduction of my, uh, of my speech, a second chance, which I think is crucial. And in fact, the Dutch Minister uh, for Legal Protection already decided in 2019 to implement the programs of the uh, Open Justice uh, 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 centers 
to implement the programs permanently. So that is a very good thing. So once more, thank you all for coming in person to the uh, embassy. And I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Dreisinger to come forward and say a little bit more about the documentary. Thank you very much. Good morning, good morning. I, I don't have the height of the Dutch, <laughs> alas. Uh, it's, it's, thank you so much, Ambassador Haspels. Uh, thank you to the staff here uh, at the, the embassy, especially Peter Slord, who has been fantastic in, in helping us coordinate this beautiful event in this beautiful venue. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, and, and again, thank you to uh, Attorney General Carl Racine for attending, and to all of you for being here. I think we can all be thrilled that this is not another webinar. Uh, it's a great joy to be at an in-person event. Uh, so my name is Boz Dreisinger, and I am the founder and executive director of Incarceration Nations Network. And we are a global network of justice reimaginers and prison reformers. We have 119 partners around the world on every continent uh, doing a range of work from educational work in prisons to reentry work, to broad reaching policy work and, and advocacy work. And we are about creating border crossing partnerships, collaborations and events like this one today in the hopes of ad advancing our partners' agendas worldwide and creating global coalitions. So it's my great hope that much will come of this uh, event today beyond uh, simply the event in terms of collaborations and coalition building. Uh, and in fact, one of, I want to give a nod to one of our partners here today, based at the Attorney General's office, the Restorative Justice Program in Washington, D.C., who uh, we see as an incredible model for the world. And uh, last month I was thinking about this event and I was thinking about how to introduce, uh, give you a sense of kind of what led me to start Incarceration Nations Network. We're relatively new, about three years old. And I was in Lisbon, uh, Portugal, and I was there with a couple of our partners setting up a screening event, and we were visiting some prisons and, and learning more about the work that's being done. And as we were driving to our screening event, we passed this uh, massive sort of bastion. Uh, it looked like an old medieval castle, and of course it's a prison. And I have seen versions of this same medieval-looking structure in cities all over the world, from Santiago, Chile, to K Kigali, Rwanda. And of course, it's not an accident that they look uh, the same. That is because they're modeled after the same US prison in Pennsylvania, uh, Eastern State Penitentiary, which has been the model for more than 350 prisons worldwide, the same kind of medieval-looking dungeon that is, you know, essentially belongs in another century. And I looked at it, and, and no matter how many times I've seen this same structure um, sort of cut and pasted all over the world, I, I still look at it in shock. And, and that day I looked at it and I thought, my God, we don't send people to a hospital that looks like it did in the 19th century, and yet we send them to justice systems that, that do, um, or so-called justice systems that do. And so I ultimately, that is what inspired me to create INN, that feeling of why are we not innovating? Why are we still existing in um, some, some medieval uh, version of the 19th century? And how can we think about doing things in a, more, a much more innovative fashion? And I think ultimately what we need to do that is many things. We need a sense of radical imagination cross-border thinking, building justice systems, not from a place of fear and anxiety, but a place of optimism and total freedom, and that includes financial freedom, because doing this work well does cost. Uh, and ultimately, too, I think so much of it does not have to be rocket science. And I know our panelists, who I'm excited to engage with, will agree with me about this, that there is so much that, that is the most radical revolutionary ideas are actually common sense. This idea that education changes lives, right? This idea that if you treat someone with humanity and with love, then that person acts with humanity and love. 
These, to me, are very basic concepts, and it's been a privilege in building Incarceration Nations Network to collaborate with organizations that are doing this worldwide, that are thinking outside the box uh, in this capacity. And, and that's why I ultimately say that prisons are just a fundamentally outdated, uninnovative mode of, of doing justice or attempting to do justice. They do not reduce crime, they do not build safer communities, they don't advance peace and justice, and they don't give the harmed people the healing that they deserve. And so it's time to move past this and to focus on innovations. And so that ethos is much of what inspires the film that you're about to, to see, the short film. It's actually part of a series, a docu-series, that I completed um, in the context of COVID. I will say that uh, it, was, it was in the very early days of COVID, and I'm a New York City native, and, and we were obviously hit very hard and very early. I pulled out all of this footage that I had been shooting in the context of traveling the world, going to prisons and engaging with organizations doing the work, and I started just transcribing interviews uh, one after the other, uh, in part because it was, the, it, was, it was something I could focus on in the midst of all of the, the madness that was unfolding, and also because it was deeply inspirational to see people who had lived through much worse and come out on the other side and, and hear their narratives. And so all of that ended up resulting in a docu-series called Incarceration Nations, and it is a mixed media series about global mass incarceration narrated entirely by those who have lived incarceration around the world from England to El Salvador, Brazil, and Lebanon, to South Africa and Sierra Leone. And there are 10 episodes in the series. We're watching one today titled Correcting Correctional Centers. And I, I will say that overall, um, and this episode is a little bit different from some of the others uh, because it's not as driven by the direct narratives of people who have lived the experience because it focuses on sort of these centers, these innovative approaches. Um, but ultimately, I wanted to make something that was quite, that was in some ways motivated more by what it is not than what it is. So I did not want to engage in making another series of sort of lurid, exploitative, violent images of prison. In fact, there are very few images of prison in the docu-series altogether. It's about focusing on the humanity, on the people, um, and not on making sort of sensationalist uh, content. And uh, I did not only want to focus on the problems and reiterating the crisis, which we know is a crisis, but really try to think about the work uh, of, of people attempting solutions and what that looks like. And of course, to elevate and amplify the work of our partners, which is what we do as an organization. And then lastly, uh, I did not want any talking heads or many talking heads in the film or quote unquote experts. The experts in the film are the people who have lived this experience and, and speak to it and act as living witnesses. So uh, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Correcting Correctional Centers and um, looking forward to a rich discussion afterwards. Thank you all. this is one of a larger series. There's an episode that focuses on women, there's one on restorative justice, there's one called education, not incarceration, and um, all of them, again, spanning the globe. And again, all of them meant to, I think, and, and I know we're gonna talk more about this, but uh, the idea is not necessarily to say that any one of these is the magic bullet, the answer, but rather to say, here are some examples of people and, and organizations and entities that are thinking outside the box and that are pushing the boundaries of what's possible. And I think especially looking at the, uh, when I, we just had a screening in Prague, in fact, uh, in support of that facility, which managed, it's still this one exception to the rule. The rest of the prisons in Prague, in the Czech Republic rather, look nothing like that one facility. Uh, and yet the fact that it exists shows that something is possible. Uh, and that, that you can use that as an entry point to make change. And the same is true of Uruguay. Uh, Luis started that out of his own passion and, and kept it alive. And so I think another thing that we have to do is consistently show support to innovation and, and outside the box thinking when it happens. And uh, so it's, it's really exciting to be able to do that as we did these screenings in support of these 
uh, these, these entities and these organizations. So we have an incredible panel to talk about uh, not just the film, and we'll have a chance for Q&A, of course, so if folks are interested in engaging um, with, with me around the film or any of the organizations in it, we can do that too. But we are joined by some wonderful folks uh, to talk about justice innovation as it relates to youth. So Yiska Wallace-Lems is here um, all the way from the Netherlands. Uh, she started her career as a child protection social worker in the Netherlands and eventually became advisor at the Ministry of Justice there and is now the project manager for the development and implementation of the small scale custodial youth facilities in the Netherlands, which you just saw here. Um, we also have Clinton Lacey, who is the president and CEO of the Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement, CM3, which focuses on supporting Credible Messenger mentors who share similar life experiences with current justice-involved young people. And Clinton's biography is long and esteemed. Uh, he previously served as director of the DC Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, deputy commissioner of the New York City Probation Department, and Associate Executive Director of Friends of Island Academy. I never knew that, and I want to chat to you about that, uh, which serves 16 to 24-year-olds at Rikers Island in New York City. And Antonio Fernandez was the leader of the New York chapter of the Latin Kings and has worked directly with street organization members in D.C., Newark, New York City, Spain, and Ecuador to redirect their energies toward community building, Tone's current organization currently focuses on serving the youth charged as, charged as adults as well as those committed to DC's Juvenile Justice Department where he and his team of formerly incarcerated mentors work to help young people grow up, grow out. I'm excited to go visit with him and his team today um, and is also partnered with Clint on CM3. So welcome to our panelists or our conversants rather. Hi, everybody. Um, so glad to be here today. I'm very excited and honored to be invited to be part of this event at the Dutch Embassy. Um, so thank you all very much. I thought uh, to start off the conversation, I'd give you a little context on the Dutch youth justice system. You just already saw quite a lot about uh, our initiative to open up small scale open youth facilities in the Netherlands. Uh, but I want to give you some background on how we came to that innovation. And uh, as I said, some context on the youth justice system as well. Um, back in 2015, there were still seven high security uh, youth prisons in the Netherlands. But what we saw was that uh, a lot of these institutions, the amount of young people that was coming into the system, being incarcerated, was actually declining a lot. So we had a lot of empty beds in the youth prisons, uh, which actually sparked a conversation about what, where do we want to go with this system? Um, because it meant that if we had to close more prisons down, which as we already had done in the years previous to that, that meant that young people would have to travel even further uh, to these institutions, and so would their parents to see them. Contact with the community would be even more difficult. Um, so we wanted to try and, and think of a solution for that. Um, young people in remand as well, on remand awaiting trial, as well as sentenced young people are in the same institutions, uh, so part of these seven institutions. Um, and you can be as young as 12 uh, to get into the youth justice system in the Netherlands, which is quite rare. We see a lot of 16, 17, 18 or older young people coming into the system. In the Netherlands, you can also be subject to the youth justice system when you're between 18 and 23 years old, depending on your personal circumstances and your personal development. But we see that that, as what we call the adolescent penal code, is being used not as much as maybe we would like it to be. Um, and so uh, to start the conversation about where we wanted to go with the youth justice system, in 2015, we organized, the Ministry of Justice organized an exploration, which was part of a conversation with over 120 professionals working in the field, and also a lot of young people, of course, to see uh, what innovations could we come up with to still offer uh, a place for young people that were being incarcerated, but maybe not in a traditional way that we knew up until then. So what we came up with was a few um, important points that we wanted to abide by, which we wanted to close connection with the communities these young people were coming from. We wanted to enable them to continue their way of life 
uh, their school, their education, their work, uh, and uh, any other positive connections they might have as much as possible. Uh, so the protective factors in their life should have should play a really important part of what they were going through, what else they were going through the system. So that means an important role for parents, but also for sports coaches, for example, or any other important factors in their life. Um, and we wanted a tailored approach. So as uh, the director of Reskilled said in the film as well, if you have a really big facility, it's really hard to offer a tailored approach because everyone has to abide by the same rules. If you have a small facility, it's much easier to look at one young person, what level of security, but also what level of care does this young person need? What liberties can they handle? Uh, and it's also easy to have the continuous conversation with the young person about how it's going with him, what he's struggling with, and how what we can do to help him out. Um, and as I said, a local approach, which is super important. So most of our small-scale facilities are in the middle of a city. The, the picture you saw of the one in Amsterdam, that's it. There's no fence. There, it's just the front door, and then you have the street where people live in the residential area. So that's most of them. Uh, some data on the Dutch system. Um, another important thing that we realized in 2015 was that half of our young people stay incarcerated less than a month. So this is a huge population of young people in pretrial detention who, at the point of entry in the system, the judge decides it is too risky to let him go home. But a month later, apparently, either uh, it, then he's ready to be released, usually on pretrial bail. So this made us think, okay, why does he need the high level of security for just one month? But after that, apparently, it's not necessary anymore. So that gave us the idea that there must be a huge amount of young people in our prisons that don't actually need the high fences and the barbed wire and being locked up away from their community, uh, even for a small amount of time. Uh, and obviously, we have the same issues as I'm sure a lot of you recognize, that a lot of young people are already in contact with social services or in the care system and also have problems with maybe drug use or, or psychological problems. Um, and the average age, uh, in, as I already said, in our institutions is quite high. 17, 18, 19 year olds is the main group of young people. This is the map as it is now. We have five high security institutions left, which are the little uh, bigger buildings you see, and the little houses are our small scale facilities. So they're mainly, as you can see, the west of the country is it's the most densely populated area in the Netherlands. That's where all the big cities, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, uh, The Hague are. Uh, and that's where we also see that these institutions work the best, because that's where you have uh, densely populated cities where young people don't have to travel too far to get to school. There's lots of public transport links that they can use. In the countryside, which is mostly the north and the south, it's more difficult because young people might have to travel quite far to get to school. Uh, and that makes temptations uh, bigger and also the network might be further away. So this is what was decided uh, in 2019. We started off with some experiments from the small scale facilities and then it was decided that it would be rolled out permanently in from 2019. And this year, just a few months back, our last two small-scale facilities in The Hague and Rotterdam opened their doors. So uh, as part of the experiments, we really monitored, uh, we had a university monitor the experiments so that we would have reliable data on what actually the outcomes were for these young people, uh, which helped us a lot in trying to push for permanent decision-making, permanent political decision-making to take these initiatives further. Uh, so what we found was uh, of 70% of education that young people were already in got continued and 37% uh, got initiated. It's not always adds up to 100% because some of the 70 may have stopped and then started up a new form of education while they're inside. Uh, we also did a follow-up uh, at three, uh, anywhere between three and 26 months after the kids left the facilities. 72% uh, still had a structured daytime activity. 64% uh, lived at home. 63% uh, had a network that was involved. 50% uh, was satisfied about their stay at the facility. Uh, and unfortunately, there was 15% that did end up at a closed, uh, one of our high security facilities. 94% of uh, care or social work got continued, and 53% of the cases it was initiated. 
Uh, and what was really important that the parents had a really active role. So we let the parents, they are the ones that still call school if their kid's sick and can't go in. The school has to call the parents when something goes wrong as well as the facility. Um, and the parents have to make sure that the kid has a bus pass, for example, to go to school. So the parents really stay in their role of responsibility and we try and obviously help them where, uh, where they're struggling, but the responsibility stays with them. Um, I just want to touch on briefly on, we still have five high security facilities as well, uh, and we're also trying to reform those. So they, they, do, they do have high walls and they are closed, and they have education inside, but we are trying in the high security prisons as well to offer a more tailored approach. So some young people might have more liberties than others. Uh, we're trying to involve the probation services and the community more as well. Uh, and we also want to involve parents and other protective factors more in the high security facilities. So the program that we're doing at the moment for reform is obviously the small scale open facilities are the most innovative part of that, but the high security prisons are also going through reform. And then to kick off the discussion, I guess, um, we are really proud of the small scale facilities, but there's also uh, challenges that we face, of course. Um, it's hard sometimes to get people to come on board and put people in these small scale facilities that might be considered uh, to have committed very serious offenses, uh, to change people's perspectives on what is high security, what's low security, and who needs it, and what does relational security mean. Uh, we offer that a lot in the small scale facilities, so what was talked about in the film as well, making real contact with the young people, really listening to what they have to say, trying to de-escalate before anything even escalates. In the movie, you saw the timeout room. Uh, we don't have those anymore because in two years in Amsterdam, it was never used. And now we're putting the small scale facilities into legislation. We've decided not to include it in the legislation. So that meeting is now, that room is now um, an extra meeting room where kids can meet their parents, but a timeout room is not necessary. Um, and also what we see now is that incarceration numbers can be unpredictable. The prediction was that it would decline further so that we could easily close these two high security prisons uh, and still have room to spare. But that's now unfortunately not the case. So our youth prison, our high security prisons are uh, really under a lot of pressure. There's a lot of young people coming into them at the moment and the low security ones, the small scale ones are a little underused. And that has to do with uh, that their crime is still declining in the Netherlands, but serious violent crime in young people is actually increasing. Uh, so that means that we have more challenges ahead to try and really look even at these young people that are being accused of serious offenses to whether they can take the responsibility to function in an open facility uh, because by looking at their personal circumstances, maybe more than just the offense that they committed. But that takes more convincing. Uh, and more work ahead of us. So that's a little introduction. There we go. When I visited the small scale facilities in, in the Netherlands and met Hutz and the team there, the word that they kept using again and again was normal, 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 normal. So getting back to the theme of sort of common sense and it not being the, the best methodology is almost no methodology to just engage in normalcy, um, right? That, that that's what was emphasized there. Two uh, questions for you, Jeske. One is, the how, do, how in the Netherlands did you deal with kind of what we call nimbyism? Not in my backyard, right? We don't want this little facility here. Um, and also sort of the general punitive attitudes of the public that is saying, what do you mean you're letting them leave and go to work and go to school? Um, how do you address that? And then my second question is about whether there's any conversation about this model for older um, individuals as well, and, and not simply for youth. Uh, yeah, we, there's definitely NIMBY mentality that we faced as well with setting up the small scale facilities. And what we did is uh, even before the facilities even opened, quite a long, long time before, we engaged the neighborhoods in uh, what was going to happen. 
So all the residents around the small-scale facilities received letters and information about the facility that was going to be opened there. They were invited to come in and have a look. They had a direct number of the managers there if anything was going on. Also, we engaged with the municipality. So for a short time after opening, there was an increased police presence, even though we didn't necessarily feel it was necessary, but really to uh, show the public that we were on top of it. The bushes around the facilities got cut down more. Um, and uh, the, the, we, have, we still have some neighborhood officers as well in the, in the Netherlands, in every community. So they were really engaged and they were contactable if anything was going on. And in Amsterdam specifically, they decided for the first six months or so not to use the balcony, not to allow young people to go on the balcony, just so it would prevent any you know, young people shouting or, or throwing cigarettes on, from the balcony onto the street, just so it was really sure that the neighborhood would become comfortable with the, um, the facility being there. And we also try and uh, arrange events now. So it's not just at the start, but yeah, there's, you have to have a continued relationship with the neighborhood. So there's events, there's open days where the neighborhood can come in and have a look around. Uh, the direct contact with the manager is super important. But we found that there's very few incidences, uh, no, none that have led to police intervening. Um, because the young people, as the young person said in the film himself, they've got something to lose. They know that if they mess up, that they are they can go straight back into or go to a high security prison. So our uh, experience with neighborhoods is really good in that there's very few problems at all, but better to be ahead of it. So, yeah. And yes, there are experiments as well with uh, adult small scale facilities. Uh, so far, as I understand it, they are closed, so they're small scale, but they're uh, less, um, uh, they go less far in the sense that of really going out to your own job and all that kind of stuff. But that's what they're working towards. There's a comprehensive program which allows experiments in the Netherlands uh, for uh, uh, the justice system in general. Uh, and there are experiments that are like that for adults as well. But there's no decision on like permanently implementing that in the system yet. Nice to hear. And I think um, it's a, the, the facility in Prague that you saw, Yereche, is also very closely engaged with its community. And the community loves having them there. They're, you know, it's a very porous wall, obviously, and there's a tremendous amount of, of, of support from the community. Um, so the nimbyism sometimes is a great misconception altogether, right? Um, thank you. Uh, Clinton, let's turn to you. You've been doing this uh, work, so thinking about innovations in the space of, uh, in, in a US context, I definitely think that the credible messenger concept and movement is something that, uh, that is, a, is a tremendously powerful innovation here that we don't see, I have not seen as much of in the world. So can you give us a sense of what, it, what, is, what is the Credible Messenger movement? What is CM3? What is the work you're doing? And also, how does it distinguish from, there's a lot of terms being thrown around now, violence, interruption, so on and so forth. How do you see all of these things in relationship and in relation to what you're doing? Uh, thank you, and um, again, honored to be on the distinguished panel and with the distinguished audience to engage in this conversation. Um, I think I first just look quickly put in the context of what we think of credible messenger work as, right? And so um, credible messengers are essentially people with shared life experiences of those who are involved in the system, uh, rooted in those communities from those neighborhoods, have a high level of experience and expertise um, in the fabric of the community, in the experience of being marginalized, of being impacted by systems, have a story to tell of their own restoration and struggle and uh, success of overcoming uh, those experiences and circumstances and have made a conscious decision that they are going to be part of the solution, part of healing, part of growth and the development and part of empowering young people and families and older people who are impacted by the justice system um, and impacting those communities. And so that's a sort of broad, sort of universal uh, definition of credible messengers. And I thank you for the question, Baz, in terms of distinguishing some of the uh, initiatives or approaches that are taking place. 
But first, I'd just like to quickly put into a broader context what credible messenger work is for us. Um, and we certainly have had um, great success in, uh, in terms of, um, or credible messengers have been hugely successful in demonstrating uh, their worthiness and the worthiness of investing in communities, investing in the villages that we all talk about it takes to raise our healthy children and healthy families. Um, so really Credible Messenger for us is representative of a larger idea of shifting uh, total soul reliance on institutions and systems to essentially administer justice, to solve problems, right? To help young people and prevent young people and others from entering into the justice system, shifting a reliance on our formal institutions and, and increasing our reliance on the very communities where our people come from, right? Investing in the village's capacity to do the work of care, of healing, of rehabilitation, if you wanna use that word, right? Um, of, of, of providing guidance and structure and hope and discipline and opportunity, all the things that we have traditionally relied on systems to provide, right? Um, we, there's an acknowledgement and what, what Credible Messenger says is, no, we have to invest in the village's ability to do that. And so Credible Messengers are then those frontline primary um, deliverers of that of support, right? Uh, and the people, or at least representative of a group of people who need to have greater voice, opportunity, power, resources to, to do justice, essentially, right? To do the work of of solving conflicts, um, of restoration, of healing. Um, and so that's really what, what it, it represents for us, um, this investment in community. Um, there are, and, and it's quite clear, I mean, we know that, um, we were talking earlier about it and looking at the film, um, there's examples of really uh, promising and innovative work that's taken place. I had an opportunity to go to Finland and Norway about two years ago to visit the, the open prisons and some of the other systems there. And there's no question that culturally um, those uh, nations and uh, that movement is, 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 I would argue, leaps and bounds beyond the culture of this nation, right? And assumptions that are made and beliefs that are held on to about punishment, right? Um, there's no question about that. And so there's a lot to learn from, from those models here in this country. Um, but we've been, had some opportunities, and you'll hear from Tone to, to talk about it, to, to, to innovate and to really um, certainly move in the direction of being, not focusing on being punitive, but really being restorative and relying on credible messengers to, uh, to be the front line of that work. And so the other thing that I would say about that is while um, that terminology is used quite a bit, you know, what I described as credible messengers are doing different work. Some credible messengers are really focused on violence prevention, often known as violence interrupters. Um, some models call for, for them to go in the community, to be on the front line, uh, literally intervening and in, in stopping shootings and other types of violence from taking place, and that's really important work. Um, when we describe, and our experience with Credible Messenger has been certainly engaging in crisis intervention, but, but really also engaging in a long-term uh, development of trusting relationships, right, of co-navigation, of providing support to young people and families and communities over the long haul, right, to help support them through their trajectory towards positive life outcomes. But what's also really important, and maybe I could just pass the mic on this note, um, credible messenger work is not just as important as transforming the lives of impacted people is, critical, hugely important. It's not just about transforming the behavior, the thinking, the attitudes, the healing of people. It's about healing sick systems. It's about healing um, destructive culture that has been rooted in the history of the justice system in this country for sure. Um, and so credible messengers demonstrate not just an impact and a transformative impact on young people and those who are in crisis and those who are in the justice system. It demonstrates um, how the village, how even those who have been most marginalized and written off have within them the expertise, the uh, ability to to transform our idea of what the system looks like itself, 
which uh, we think it, it takes. It, it will take transformation of our systems as well as of, of our young people who are in the system uh, for us to ultimately be successful. And so that's the work that we've tried to do. Um, in New York, we had a 60% reduction in recidivism, which was unprecedented through initiating the program at probation. And, and when we continue the conversation you'll hear about in DC, we continued it, but really went much deeper into uh, not just reducing recidivism, which was huge, but beginning to transform just the practice of justice and the, the culture and the policies of the justice agency itself. And specifically, uh, can you share about what we can expect from CM3 oh, yes. going forward? Yes, that CM3. And so, so we started this work, uh, and you know, the idea of credible messenger, right? The basic concept is, is not new. We didn't discover it. Marginalized people have been stepping forward and leading the work, right, of transformation wherever they've been throughout history, I would argue. Um, but we launched CM3, we, we, four years in, in New York and then six years here in DC. We continued to innovate on the model. We began providing credible messenger service, not just to young people committed by the court, but to their grandmothers, to their family, to their siblings, to the, to the community. We brought in credible messengers into the system, as I talked about, into our agency to have voice on our decisions. And so it became clear to us as we continued to network around the country that there was this need and an opportunity to grow this work in other jurisdictions and other places around the country. So uh, for a few years, Tone and I uh, conspired to, uh, to, and he helped, he, you'll hear from him how he worked with us through this process, to, um, to engage our brothers and sisters and our friends around the country, right, who were interested in this work or doing this work essentially and finally, and we did, a, we did a summit in 2018, we brought in a, 300 people came together for a summit, ultimately culminated in March. I resigned from DYRS in DC and we launched CM3, Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement, we call it, um, because the movement is to support um, and advance credible messenger work um, around the nation, which for us is to support and advance the empowerment of villages, of community people, to participate in the practice of justice, not just receive or hope to receive a better, kinder, gentler brand of justice, but to help define and participate in the administration of justice. And that's what CM3 is trying to advance. Beautiful. And turning, passing the mic to you, Tone, uh, can you tell us a bit ab about your work with CM3, with Grow Up, Grow Out, and what this looks like on the ground? Yes, well, thank you for having me. It's an honor. And uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I started back with Clinton uh, working in the Credible Messengers in New York. I think that was uh, 2013. We started the process, and I just came home from doing a 13 and a half year bid in the federal penitentiary. And I know many of the Dracula castles she talks about, <laughs> because once you're labeled, like charged as an adult, once you're labeled a gang member, then humanity and justice changes for you. You're looked at a different lens that you can't be in a safe house or safe space any longer because the stigma of the fear they place in your community calls for harsh justice for your mistake. And that's all done by legislation, law, teaching, colleges, professing and holding on to these scary titles, but yet you want the community to accept me. So we gotta change that language, right? So that's the first thing I found when I went into these institutions. I've been to 13 across the country. I've been in Rockers Island. So I got a good outlook of what is an institution and the fear-based model that America uses. With draconian sentences to minimize crimes that are nonviolent. So before we talk about saving us, let's talk about what's killing us. So a lot of times you see that communities internalize this indifference and they blame police officers, case managers, and community. They take out the legislation part and the teaching part out of the problem. So in that I found out that's where we must work. That's where we must teach all of them their place at the table. How to work progressively but not insult the community that they're not capable to raise their kids. 
that they're not allowed to take a gang member and return him to Antonio Fernandez as a productive citizen in his community. And that's what me and Clinton started doing, taking people as myself that do harsh sentences, that experienced it, internalized that pain, but didn't get it angry, didn't get really mad at the people that treated us unhuman, but found the remedy in ourselves to look at the problem in a bigger scale of how do we resolve it. So how do you resolve it, right? The greatest thing to, to crime or to violence is to get the pedicillin, which is the ex-gang member, the ex-guy that was in these castles, who could explain to this young mind the consequence of behaviors in the community that could lead to these places. And through our experience, help them navigate through these things that community have, right? So what I teach in Grow Up Grow Out is oppression leads to aggression, that leads to violence. You can't teach oppression, and you can't teach a kid after he committed the violence. You're really gonna teach him how to go to jail and go do 13 years. So after you interrupt, he's facing a sentence, not a free, a new progressive life of intervention. So that's where I said, we gotta intervene. When this process happens, what are we doing with the community? Like Clint says, how is the mother being treated with the shock that her kid just committed a crime? Who is there to help her navigate with now how the community sees her? How do we deal with the father and the whole system in itself with these, these experienced mothers who had a son in jail? Now could go to that mother and say, it's not your fault. This happens. This is how we get through this. We're gonna help you navigate through this system. And Clinton took the credible messenger where he built a team and he showed us that we were not only the, the, the fact of talking to the problem, but we had to infiltrate the system. And then he had to put the credible messenger on the first floor of the Rockers Island or this building. And I had to invade their space and get them to respect my voice. And as King Tone, as the gangster, of course you're gonna come. Hold up, I'm a professor, what do you mean you know? you know this better than I. How could you talk to this kid and teach? When I went through college, I got this big debt that I gotta pay. I'm the professional in this problem, where we forced our way to them to respect our voices, with us understanding their knowledge, and the place where they could help that circle of community. To stay in their place. Once in the community, the number one budget in your community is Gail's budget, and criminal justice, we get left behind. Schools, after school programs, and all the things we fear the community to hand over. So as a credible messenger, and grow up, grow out, right now I got 10 full-time employees in two youth facilities in DC. We're there from six in the morning all the way to seven at night. We are part of the case management, which is called the core team. We know the credible messenger has a team in the jail that sits with mental health, behavioral health, restorative practices for the community to resolve problems. And then we also have ourselves in the circle. And then individually, what we found when you bring all three of these together, the kid starts understanding the village that they're in, which is incarceration. But they start getting the practice of self-resolve, self-thinking through the mechanism of their problems, and finding their way out to jail with self-thought, independent thinking, not getting institutionalized. We can't do that yet. Me and Clint said, could we remove the gate of our facility? I want the gate gone. I want the closed door gone. Why? Because I did three years in solitude confinement with no human contact. Didn't, wasn't able to write a letter. Wasn't able to write my mother. I was kept 500 miles from my home, so no one could visit me. They destroy the village and the American justice in a format. And that's the problem, really, of racism. They don't know how to become free. We never gave them the chance after their first mistake to practice freedom with big brothers, a good system that's respecting their humanity, getting them back out the wall. So with these 10 brothers in these youth facilities, we, uh, we write 136 notes a day, my credible message. We interact with the kid in school, in the yard, when he's in his cell, I got a key to the jail. I open the doors. I don't go through the process. I am a staff member there. 
That's the first sign of not getting change is when you don't respect the messenger who's speaking the change. So if I walk with a security guard, right, and they have to open the door, what's the first kid thinks? You have no power. You're just like me. They don't trust you yet, Tom. So that's where Clinton is changing. He made the system give me the key. And as he gave me the key, I started opening doors for the last five years. We had no stabbings in the prison. Our fights, we got no special unit to put them in after they fight. They stay in the unit with the man they fought, and they're going to figure it out. And we're going to talk through that. Because if you remove them from each other, the fear grows. They don't know what the other guy's doing. But if you keep them in front of each other, they understand. You see, all those punitive behaviors you do over fear. We remove fear, and we replace it with love and understanding and then the facility. We train all of them in restorative justice. So it's a team effort in changing the system. The village accepts the change way before the draconian system does because they wasn't made to re repent us, to make us feel remorseful. It's made for punishment and anger and to, to, to feel that no one loves me in my worst moment. So I think that's what we do with Credible Messengers. We enforce love in public policy. We bring the message of transformation, an evidence-based program. <laughs> I'm an evidence, right? I'm evidence-based, my life. Not what they taught me. It was how I learned to make the decisions. Now I could be an expert in the street, in the, in the institution, or with a family that needs to trust a messenger and understand how did we get to the place where they accept us with their children to give our message, right? The parent will know, Tom, he's a gangster. How is he talking to my kids? So like she said, transparency, right? Meet us, get us, touch us, find out who we are. And you see that we're one of the, the most effective models right now in America going around. If you practice it with the full, full, full process, you could change the village, you could interrupt the system, and then you could break the box that they're in and make them think innovative, innovative ways to resolve these issues that our children are in jail. And I think I got to pull that line out, you know, love, this is love in public policy. And I know this is something both of you speak a great deal about. I know with the Prison to College Pipeline Program, which I founded at John Jay College, love is central to the work always. And we try to make it about, you know, charts and statistics and recidivism rates. But the reality is this is about love and it has to come from love and it is love manifested as action. And to that effect, I actually had a question for Yiska Antone about staff in the, in f in the context of facilities. Um, I know that, Tone, you've spoken about this idea of love on both sides of the spectrum. Globally speaking, I mean, as was mentioned in the film, there are very few places where you have staff at correctional facilities or frankly police in any countries that get any training that lasts more than like maybe six months, right? Yet. In Norway, in Finland, you know, you have an entire academy. I visited the Norwegian, and I'm sure you did too when you guys went on the trip. The idea of spending years doing, engaging around philosophy and law and social work and restorative justice, you know, just as a teach, a classroom is as good as its teacher. Any quote unquote facility is only as functional as the people in there. We do have a partner, by the way, in the UK that's working to change this. They're called Unlock Graduates, and they're trying to build a kind of Teach for America for corrections officers, essentially. It's a great model. Anybody wants to know more, I'm happy to share their info. I, I plug them whenever I can, because I think it's really, really innovative, because the staff issue. So share a bit about who's doing the work. I know when I met Chut in the Netherlands, I was like, this is not somebody I've met before in the context of, of a facility. Yeah, so uh, Ruud is the manager for the small scale facility in Amsterdam. It was the first one that opened, and he did a lot of work on thinking about W and and practicing okay what kind of staff do i want these young want to work in these innovative facilities so what we saw at first is that it was a combination of people who were working in the youth prison before because there used to be a youth prison in amsterdam but that one got closed down so some staff came from the youth prison and some staff came from other care professions typically and what he found is that it was really hard for people who were used to working in high security facilities to let go of being able to have your pager 
on your belt and 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 have that uh, timeout room or have your whole security team behind you to back you up if something happens. You need to work with these young people through connection. And if you make that connection, then you can know early on what's going on. So he really selected his staff and he learned this also through years of, of, of developing this facility more on skills than on diplomas. So he really looks at... Uh, are these people coming from the communities these young people are coming from? Do they have a shared background? Can they be a role model for these young people? And do they know how to connect with them? And a huge part is played by their caretakers who are uh, have security training but are being retrained as pedagogical security uh, workers, basically. So they're the first point of contact when the young person comes into the facility. They do search them and they do have to hand in their phone, but they also have the first point of contact, say... All right, you just came back from school. How was your day? Look them in the eye. What's going on with you today? Did you have a good day? Did you have a bad day? Anything going on? And these caretakers have now developed their own training program in relational security so they can go on and train the caretakers in the other open facilities and also any other facilities, just as related or not, that is interesting in receiving this kind of training. So they really developed this training and this way of working where you contact you uh, try and prevent having to intervene through uh, hard physical security, but you do it through really speaking to the young person. And we have some great examples where uh, staff suspected something was going on with the young people, but they didn't, uh, they, they just waited. And then the young, and they had conversations with the young person and eventually the young person came up themselves and said, look, something happened in the community. I got involved with something or my parents just visited and my dad handed me a couple of cigars. I know I'm not allowed to have them, so I'm going to give them back to you now. And that's through contact rather than through searching them, restraining them, things like that. So that's the philosophy in the, in the facilities. Well, yeah, the same. So you could imagine me in Rockers Island or in a secure facility and the staff find out I was the leader of a big gang in America, right? So they look like, how do we trust them, right? How, is he gonna bring in drugs and all the stigmatization they get of a reformed person, someone who found his truth. So the first thing is treat the staff like you treat the kid. Give them the love that the government and their system stop giving them. A lot of POs, a lot of systems, their walls are yellow. You go to a, a police station in, in, a, in New York, it's one of the disgusting most places you could go. And they got one of the most biggest and powerful unions. They worry about more overtime than where they sit and do their work. That is gross. See how the eye, the vision loses of what's really happening? So what I'm saying, I got to love the system first. So what I learned, I don't argue with staff in the youth facility anymore. I'm patient and I understand that this was years of training. So what he did first, every, every graduate who comes into our youth facility also gets a credible messenger training during his training to come in the facility and get the job. He's got to know the credible messenger model. He got to know the philosophy. He's got to understand that we understand our role and we understand his. And we also, we, un we might let him see that we're not judging you as the problem. We're not judging you with being on that side of this, of this dance that we're doing with the young adult to get freedom. And we make them buy in. So if we did art with the kids, we will have Tuesdays for the facility staff to do painting art in that kind of class too, to participate, to experience that behavior, right, that you're asking from the kid. And what you started seeing when we let them be restored of circle and they got in the staff, it became communication. It became non-judgmental, right? I'm the blower. I tell you what to do. Sit down. They started learning to have conversation and win over the kid with basic needs, right? Why you don't want to sit down instead of you better sit down? And then when it gets a little bit out of run, we got a tap out law. He'll tap out. He say, Tone, why don't you come here? Because he's not listening to the law no more. Maybe you could intercede and get him to do what we wish so it doesn't advance. So what I'm saying, you got to love on the staff too. Because they are a product of false information of how do you deal with justice. Remove humanity. And we're forcing them to say, no, you got to love them like you love your kid. And if your kid was in here, how would you want him treated? And what would you expect from your community when no one's looking? 
and you see the humanity of the staff come back. And they're not scared to do things because now they don't get incriminated if they buy into love. What are you doing? Are, are, are you bringing them drugs? Or why are you talking with youth number six too much? You know, is this a... They started to understand that relationship was important, but still understanding that it comes with a rule, that they still maintain it and who they are so the, the kid doesn't confuse the line. And if you see this, I'm just saying, then when they come home, we got to do the same to the police stations in the street. Show the line, show us the respectful community way they work with each other, but you got to speak to the system. You got to go in there and challenge them in the way they respect, and that's time, patience, and getting them retrained, and most of all, getting them what they deserve for their part. And he's seen that in his probation offices when I trained them, and they see me recognize their woes. It was like, they were like, wow, how did Tone even care to say that probation officers should get more money, need to be loved, they, their offices? Because I seen your place. I was there when you used to talk down to me. I seen how, what you had to do to earn your living. It must be hard. Right? And, and that's what I talk to now, is their side of the oppression that they face. And then give them a way out and a way to rethink how to deal with the individual that's been put under the order. Yeah. No, I mean, you think it's, again, common sense, right? Somebody in there should say, how was your day? <laughs> it's not so radical. Um, I have one last question for Clinton and Yiska. A uh, quick question that I have to ask in case there are any naysayers in the room, although I don't think there are looking at this crowd, but um, I have to ask about costs and, and what, it, what, it, what, do you, what, it, what do you say to people say, oh, this is too expensive, it's too costly. Um, share with us a bit about that. It reminds me of the conversation or the work that uh, Eric Kadora did in New York. Um, I think he was at John Jay at one point and he I think coined the phrase the million dollar blocks. And the million dollar blocks were the blocks in New York City. They were impoverished economically, right? But black and brown folks living on blocks, high unemployment, poor services, poverty. But they were coined, they were called million dollar blocks because millions of dollars had been spent. And he calculated the millions per block that was spent to incarcerate people, largely for nonviolent crimes, by the way, because of drug policy and what have you, right? But anyway, so I think about that when the issue of cost comes up, because we know the prison industrial complex, mass incarceration, and the vast billions of dollars that are spent for a failed system without an adequate investment into the village where the people are coming from, right? We know that equation. We can see that pretty clearly. And so in New York City, when we launched, you know, there was a, a windfall of funding, a combination of private uh, foundations. We had a billionaire for a mayor, um, a Bloomberg, and the Soros Foundation. So they put up half of the money. The city put up half. So we had this $130 million initiative called the Young Men's Initiative. And that is where we first launched our first credible messenger initiative called Arches, um, which, was, which, was, which was nice, which was great. When we got to D.C., there was no such funding uh, available. And so we had to do what systems are going to have to do is confront their own beliefs, their own priorities, right? And recognize what I heard someone say recently that their budget, a budget is a moral document, right? Where are you spending your money? How are you prioritizing? So we attacked our budget in DC and we divested from funding that was paying for residential placement for children out of their home, out of the district, around the country. And we, 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 reduced the, we, we reduced those lines, and we invested in community-based credible messenger programs. That's how we paid for it, right? And the bet that we made was that those same children that we spend millions of dollars a day, to, uh, millions of dollars a year to send away, if we invest that money in the village, and credible messengers and other support, we can keep those young people home. And so that was a true, quote unquote, justice reinvestment process, reinvesting, what, what represented a change priority. Um, so that's how we pay for it, and that's what, it, and that's what systems have to do. It, you know, the, 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 the whole system from, from prisons to probation and parole to, you know, the whole thing. There's so many opportunities to reinvest in, into the village, as we've been talking about. And, you know, we've uh, gotten to the point where we're paying credible messengers 
um, and the funding goes to community-based organizations by and large, right? So it's about investing out of the government agency into the village, right, into, into NGOs, right, or community-based organizations. Incredible messengers are making, you know, 45, some $50,000 a year, which, right, nobody's getting rich and it's very expensive to live here and in many places, but these are livable wages for people, right, who for many is their first full-time job they've had, right, and an opportunity for them to, to, to get on a trajectory for greater, you know, self-sufficiency economically as well, and so, if it, that's that's sort of the the financial side of it. So it's really so the funding the funding argument is um, is really empty, right? It's it's a bankrupt argument. No pun intended, right? It's about unlocking. It's about liberating the dollars too, right? Not just the people, right? We got to unlock the dollars and invest them into the community in order to to sustain this work. But I think there's great potential for it to continue to grow. Yeah, I agree that the the money question is kind of a uh, is mostly a short term question because if you look at long term outcomes for young people, uh, as you said, it's common sense. If you lock someone up uh, without any treatment, which doesn't happen even in high security places, they do get treatment. But if you give them opportunity to continue their own school and to really keep that connection with their own neighborhood and uh, and give them all the opportunities they need to get their life back on track then which kid is going to cost the community more in the long term? But we all have to do with political decision making and they're only in office usually for four years. So then it's sometimes hard to make a long term plan. But that's why we've invested so much in collecting data and monitoring the facilities so that you can show with outcomes what the outcomes are and how much it can benefit the community as a whole. Also in terms, also when you're speaking about safety for the community um, and uh, preventing reoffending rates, then we hope to prove more with our current monit monitor that the outcomes for young people, if you give them the right opportunities, are better and also, also better in the long term for costs. And sometimes it's also just luck um, because we we had uh, to deal with uh, um, prisons that were really that were had a lot of empty beds, so th it was going to be an unpopular decision to close some of the prisons because obviously it also causes a lot of unemployment. Um, but uh, it did give us the opportunity to take the money that was in the in those two prisons and redirect it into opening the small scale facilities. So sometimes the stars also have to align to get something pushed through. Beautiful. Uh, so I, I'm respectful of everyone's schedule and AG Racine is gonna close us out um, in a moment. So uh, we unfortunately don't have time for Q and A's, but we are gonna be here afterward and very happy to chat. I know there's gonna be some uh, lunch being served and we're very happy to chat. I did though just want to uh, ask another INN partner in the audience to say very briefly share a bit about the restorative justice program at the Attorney General's office. Another, I think, really critical piece of justice innovation that's happening here. So, Roman, can I ask you to give us a one minute uh, spiel on the, the, the force of the restorative justice program um, here in DC? I know you can handle it. No, no, it's, um, this is, it, it is great to be in person and, and like you feel that direct connection, which is what both our program and C C CM3 and what you're doing, it really all comes down to that. I'm Roman Hayford and I really shouldn't be talking right now. It should be Seema Gajwani, who's the visionary and founder behind our restorative justice diversion program at the Office of the Attorney General, which basically takes some of these same ideas. We, we have a team, a growing team of facilitators who are essentially credible um, liaisons with youth and family who are arrested for some of the most violent, you know, offenses now. And instead of approaching them as a law enforcement officer when they're arrested, they say, look, we, we want to gi give to you what you're going to give back to us. And you, you're at a critical opportunity in your journey. You've just received this, this incident's happened, you're responsible. If you're willing to take responsibility, then we wanna work with you to make the best out of this situation. But it's gonna center you, it's not gonna center me. I'm your facilitator, but this is about you. I even say like, I'm turning the mic over to you. We wanna know who's important to you in your life, who's gonna support you through this. And 
we then take them on a journey of personal responsibility as instead of just sitting back passively in a court proceeding, you know, take a plea and that's it. We say, okay, you're, th this is about you. You are going to have an opportunity to take responsibility, but we are walking with you the whole way. And so each, 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 at each of those moments when it's like, well, I got to talk to you about what I did, that is a moment of fear and stigma and the unknown for this youth. It's hard for an adult to do that when you've done something like that. But our facilitators say, hey, we got all the time in the world. Like, you know, I, believe me, I work with other people in the same situation as you. This is confidential. Let's talk. Let's wrap. You know, let's talk about something else first. And so we get to that next phase. Okay, now they've done it with me. And then I say, okay, let's envision you talking about this with the person you actually harmed. What would that be like? Oh, I ain't gonna do that, you know, I, whatever. Okay, well, you, you, you realize you just took a step in telling me why you don't wanna talk about that. Let me, tell you, let me tell you a story about something I did and I didn't wanna talk about it. And so we wrap a little more, we talk again next week. And then in a few weeks, they, again, they are, we, we talk, I heard a lot about small scale, um, uh, taking responsibility for setting their own stage in their own environment, they, we get to a point where the youth and the person who's harmed are telling us as their facilitators of justice who they want in the room. You know, we work with victims. Who's most important to you? Who is it important to you that hears the story and witnesses you receiving the healing that you need? And we bring them into the circle. And so that, I just would really want to acknowledge the Attorney General for spending eight long years to help bring, bring us to a point where this program is not just inspirational, but is working to make real change for more and more youth. So with, with that said, we, you know, we consider ourselves part of this ecosystem along with the Credible Messenger program, along with Cure Violence and other things like that, because it's all boiling down to trying to apply some of these same principles of you know, letting the village create its own healing and justice with, with a more innovative facilitation. So. Yes, innovative being the operative word. Thank and you I for think, the opportunity but I, and I don't think we've seen that level of systemic investment in restorative justice, incredible messenger in open, humane facilities. These are rarities around the world, and so you know, our job collectively is is to see that get pushed um, in a global capacity, um, as opposed to just exporting that same old, what'd you call it, the Dracula's castle right. model, right? right? So getting past that. And, and just and one thing, just to be clear, this, the Dracula's castle, the whole innovation that, that Attorney General Racine and SEMA thought is our program is within the Attorney General's office, which is an innovative idea, which you don't see. So trying to grow that seed within. Yes. And, and speaking of, um, I'd like to invite A.G. Racine to, to close us out with remarks. And thank you to all of the panelists, to, to, to all of you present, and to you guys for, for being part of this event. Thank you so much. may look like I'm going to give prepared remarks. I'm not. Um, this is a great outline from which I will talk, um, you know, hopefully not that long, um, but maybe longer than I anticipated, candidly, because um, I'm so moved um, by the extraordinary work and dedication of the people who have preceded me uh, on this stage. Um, so first, let me thank uh, our host, um, the ambassador, Ambassador Haspels, for your warmth and generosity and sharing this open space and allowing us to have uh, this educational uh, opportunity. Um, and you, of course, started the conversation off so well um, with a couple of questions. Um, you emphasized that our future is in the hands uh, of our young people. And that for no other reason, we need to invest and share consistent love and guidance with them. We asked the question about budgets and money. 
how ridiculous is it that we actually have to ask that question when we're talking about our children and our future. So thank you so much for having us here. And I have to tell you, he whispered to me, the ambassador, that we're all welcomed to come back on a sunny day. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll uh, you know, share some uh, levity and fun at that time. So thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. I wanted to say that before I started, you know, I'm really sorry that I don't have a cool accent. <laughs> I wish I were from New York or from Teaneck, New Jersey, uh, like Clinton, or you know, from Netherlands, uh, New York again. Instead, I'm just like a mid-Atlantic guy. <laughs> Lost my Haitian accent where I was born. Thank you for pronouncing my last name correctly. Um, so look, if I can just ask my colleagues to stand for one moment, um, and you'll understand why as I go through my remarks. Anyone who's working at the Office of Attorney General, there you go. Um, so there's Roman, who you heard from, Seema, the person who's in charge of our juvenile justice reform. Everything I talk about, literally, comes from this team, and a lot of it comes from my dear friend, who I love so much, Seema Gajwani. Aureli and Abby are part of the team. And as I talk about what we've done at the Office of Attorney General, what we'll continue to do until my very last day, um, just understand that I'm not raising myself up. I am acknowledging the creativity, uh, the intelligence, and the passion of my colleagues. Okay? All right. Let me talk a little bit about um, Dr. Baz for a second, uh, because I really think the work you've done is extraordinary. Um, not rocket science, as you pointed out. And again, what you're showing is that if you treat people, as one of the speakers said, with humanity and love, very, very, very likely, and we can get a university to do an evidence-based study, very, very likely, those folks are going to return humanity and love to you. Now, life isn't perfect. There's still going to be crime. There's still going to be you know, bad conduct. But overwhelmingly, what your research and what your publication and films are showing is the product of what love, humanity, and innovation um, can actually deliver. And it's so important that you disseminate your work broadly and widely in ways in which people take it in. Now it's mostly visual because having been in government now for nearly seven years, to be quite honest, sadly, it is the exception, not the rule, that people are asking about new ideas and new concepts most people come into government with a goal or two. And then the other stuff, and to be sure, human services is usually the other stuff. Gets done in the same old inadequate, inefficient, ineffective, wasteful way without adequate resources as it has been done, okay? So your work is really, really important. And I would urge everyone here, I know we're doing a little bit of preaching to the choir, um, to promote that work. Because you need to have decision makers understand that they can actually have an impact on people's lives and invest, uh, as the ambassador makes clear, in the younger generation. Very briefly, you know, I grew up, uh, my family's from Haiti. I grew up here in D.C., not so far from the embassy on Nebraska Avenue between Connecticut and Nevada. Trees, this is a nice area. Excellent elementary school, junior high, high school. Got into a little trouble in high school. And what did my parents do? Because they were loving, they worked really hard, and they saved a little bit of money through their hard work. They put me into a private school at St. John's High School. And that corrected you know, whatever I was thinking about and doing. 
Um, so I was really, really privileged. Okay? I played basketball. It was a great thing. Fun. And it got me all around the city in a competitive way with young people as I was growing up. Eight and under, 10 and under, 12 and under, 15 and under, 17 and under leagues, high school basketball. And what I saw immediately, I think I must have been eight or nine years old, was that, my God, there were people throughout the city who were as talented as I was and more talented than I was. I'm not talking about basketball. I'm talking about smart young men and young women who had what I thought was a limitless future. But I, I came to realize that because of where they lived, literally their zip code, mine was 20008, that's the embassy zip code, meant that their potential, their intelligence, right, was not going to be manifested in the way that mine was because of the necessary supports that I had and that which their communities did not. I'll never forget sitting next to a young girl in seventh grade. I was shy and it scared the hell out of me that she sat next to me, okay? And I asked her, because she kept sitting next to me in classes. And again, very uncomfortable for me. And so I finally said, you know, if I see her sit next to me again, I'm going to ask her, why the hell is she sitting next to me? So I said, why are you sitting next to me? You know what she told me? I know you're going places. And I want to sit and see what you write down so that I write it down wasn't a projection on me. It was her realization that the love, uh, the humanity that I received in droves was going to provide for greater opportunity. So at the Office of Attorney General, because we get really excellent people, all we care about is getting talented people who are creative, innovative, um, and are willing to come up with interesting and sometimes crazy ideas. At the Office of Attorney General, we have focused on innovation and focused on young people in the little narrow way that the Office of Attorney General can. And so when people think about the Office of Attorney General, they say, well, you bring lawsuits, you prosecute kids. That's traditional thinking, right? Dracula's castle thinking. Well, we tried to break that model and think really big. So what have we done? I mentioned uh, Credible Messengers and Cure the Streets. Cure the Streets is a violence interruption program, um, and we didn't divine it. We looked at what others were doing, and we asked whether it was successful for them and whether we might try the pilot right over here in D.C., um, and after years of trying to get the government of the District of Columbia, okay, the council of the District of Columbia, including friends of mine, to invest a dollar in violence interruption, we finally got $340,000 that would have expired in literally three months to launch a program. They call that investment. Let me just give you a counter to how government invests money. I went to a basketball game yesterday. I still like basketball. The Washington Wizards is the game I went to. I really like the owners. Ted Leonsis, I really do. Ted Leonsis and Raul Fernandez. Raul and I went to high school together. When the Washington Wizards wanted to establish a practice facility, in Ward 8, in the District of Columbia, which is across the river, it's very underserved and underinvested in. Guess what the city did? By the way, uh, by the way, uh, Raul is you know doing really well. Ted Leonsis is a billionaire. Guess what the city did? 
The city essentially gave Raul and Ted $67 million to build a practice facility and a, and a, and a, and a, and a gym uh, for the women's professional team. I'm, I'm pro-gym. But did they need that? Why wouldn't you give them $30 million and ask them to give you 10 for violence interruption? Do you think that they would have done that? Probably, right? So you talk about funding, let's be honest. The government, what'd you say, um, a budget is a moral document? I'll let you be the judge of morality there, okay? Let's be honest here. So violence interruption, as Clinton's talked about, is all about credible messengers. 70 plus men and women, 95% of whom, like, like the king, um, have spent time um, in jail. As Clinton said, minimum salary, about $45,000. We got folks making up to 140, okay? Um, people taking their kid for the first time to a doctor because they have insurance. People asking about a 401k, okay? Start thinking about tomorrow and people loving and caring about their community in such a way that they're putting themselves in the line of fire to try to interrupt violence. And we've got data that shows that it is working. And we're still calling it a pilot program because it is. And we have data that shows in some areas it's not working as well. And that's okay too. Uh, and we'll see how this pilot turns out. So. That's one thing uh, that we've been able to do at the Office of Attorney General, talk about funding. Remember we got that pittance, 340? We ended up using a settlement uh, from another matter, uh, three million bucks of it, to continue the funding. And then we ended up asking the council, not for money because they weren't gonna give it, to allow us to continue to keep a percentage of the settlements we get from our civil lawsuits to fund the program. So you ask, how much are we funding the program this year? $7.5 million from the settlements of the lawsuits that we filed. And now I got to say thank you to the council because it's starting to get into the water of the DC government system. The council actually allocated $3.5 million to us uh, this year. And I'm really I'm thrilled about that. Uh, but if they didn't, we'd pay for it ourselves. Um, next, restorative justice. I mean, you know, SEMA uh, is incredible. You heard Roman. Um, these are really, really extraordinary people that we have in our office. We launched it. It's working well. Victims, what is it, SEMA? 96% of victims after going through a restorative justice circle tell you that they would recommend it to someone who's been similarly victimized. 95% of young, I don't even like the word offenders, but I'll say it, young offenders say that they would recommend it uh, to a similarly situated young offender. And now we're keeping data to hopefully demonstrate that RJ, as we call it, reduces recidivism, which that's like one plus one, equals enhanced public safety. Can you imagine that people don't get that? They think you're just being soft? No, we're trying to make your community safer by reducing recidivism. And restorative justice does just that. And I don't have to get into the mechanics of restorative justice um, here. Uh, if you want to know more about it, please just contact us. Um, and we'll, we'll be happy to break it down for you. Also go to our website. Another thing that we've really focused on is radically expanding diversion. Diversion simply is when a kid comes into the system, try as best you can to get them out of the system. Why? Because the system, all the data points show this, once you're engaged in the system, the rates of recidivism go higher. And so diversion is a way to actually try to understand what is going on with our young people. We know what's going on. They're experiencing massive trauma. Remember 
the young girl who used to sit next to me in seventh grade, she had trauma. The folks I used to play hoops with at 10 and under, 8 and under, they were raised up in communities of great trauma. The negative influences in their lives, their role models were such that literally, and you've read this, and now people kind of read it and they gloss over it. I've heard this, they say. But kids are literally planning their funerals um, and don't expect to live beyond 21. And you wonder why um, it's like having a belt carry a gun if you're a young person. You don't expect to have a tomorrow. What you know is today. So diversion goes after that underlying trauma and provides services that reduce the trauma to allow someone to sit in school and learn, to allow a kid to be less impulsive, right? And to maybe even de-escalate a confrontation that could lead to a murder, right? Whether it's, you know, somebody wearing a good pair of Nikes um, or not. That's what it's all about. And the diversion work that we've done has been really extraordinary. We have a great partner uh, in the DC government. Um, and I, I wanna really raise her up. Uh, it's our friend Clinton, it's Hillary, um, Hillary Karens, who ran, ran that program um, at, at DHS then. Now she's got your former job at DYRS. She's, she's just like Clinton in a way, different style, different mode, but definitely pro-kid. Um, in terms of funding there, in, in, just informationally, when we got here about seven years ago, Hillary's diversion program had a budget of about $625,000, and they employed four people. So if you do the math, and you say folks are on average are getting just paid anywhere from 70 to 125, you see that the budget was really paying people salary, not services. I'm happy to tell you that that budget now exceeds $7 million, okay? Because it's working and we advocated for it. Lastly, um, I'll just raise up another program that we have that is woefully underfunded, and I'm embarrassed to even raise it up because you know that's on me. I've got to figure out, we have to figure out a way um, to, to put more money into it. Um, this is the attend program, you know, attend school. Because there are correlations, right? And it's logical uh, between truancy um, and misconduct or just being exposed to negative influences, right? If you're not in school. And so the attend program, I think we have three people. And this is, again, I, I'm ashamed to even say that. That's on me. It should be more. Or you might ask, what is the Office of Attorney General doing in an area of truancy? I just argued a correlation to potential wrongdoing, so we, that's relevant enough for us. You might ask, what the hell is the government with a $17.5 billion budget doing about truancy in the District of Columbia? I think that's a fair question. Because those three people, here's what they do. They literally, literally find out which kids are not going to school. And because we're only three, we focus on a certain area in D.C., across the river, in Ward 7 and 8. They find out who the parent or the responsible adult is. They simply go face-to-face, -face, even during the pandemic, mask, and ask, what can we do? What is the issue and how can we help get your child to school? Invariably, you know what's going on a lot of times? The child is late because the child is taking care of three other kids. Okay? Um, yeah, I had to cook breakfast. I had to do this, this, and that. How about mom? Oh, mom went to work at 630. And she has two jobs. So these aren't deadbeat, you know, nasty, poor people. These are people struggling every day and trying their best more often than not uh, to provide for their kids. Uh, and so that the ATTEND program finds the problem, okay, and tries to connect them to a solution. And if need be, we go pick the young person up 
and take that kid to school. Um, simple, common sense, as you said, normal interventions, practical um, that work. So I will conclude my remarks by once again uh, thanking uh, the ambassador, Dr. Baz, and the great, great panel, uh, my colleagues, um, and the assembled guests. And I just leave you with this. It ain't rocket science. You want to do the same old stuff that literally leaves our kids destined almost for failure? Go ahead. If you want to do something different, demand it from your elected officials. Thank you.